after the war, the RCAF was reduced to an establishment of just 16,000 and resumed its traditional peacetime activities, aerial photography and survey, transport, Arctic resupply, and search and rescue. But it was also a period of firsts for the Air Force, as wartime developments were tested and put into service. Rockcliffe's number one photo establishment was probably the most modern air survey photographic laboratory in the post-war world. In 1946 alone, it photographed more than 400,000 square miles of Canadian territory and processed over a million prints. The RCAF took delivery of the first of an eventual 85 vampires in January 1948. They entered service at the Central Flying School at Trenton, and the nimble little fighters were an instant hit with their pilots. Soon, a recruiting drive would boost enrollment. Existing air bases would be upgraded and new ones built. Jet aircraft would be designed and built in Canada. All this in response to increasing nervousness about the new Soviet threat. Canada joined the North Atlantic Treaty Organization in 1949, committed to the joint effort to counter the forces of the Soviet Union. At the Winter Experimental Establishment, extremely valuable tests on cold weather operations were carried out for both the RCAF and the RAF. Indeed, this became another area of expertise, perhaps not surprisingly given the Canadian climate. Two main locations were used, Watson Lake, which was cold, and Churchill, which was just as cold, but it was windy too. The first rotary wing aircraft went into service with the RCAF in 1947, initially with Sikorsky H-5s and later with Bell H-13s. The Mid-Canada Line project, part of the air defense of North America, was the RCAF's first major helicopter operation. In 1954, 102 radar sites were strung across the north from BC to the Labrador coast. Building the system was a fantastic achievement. Several types of helicopters were used to transport material and equipment. All from 108 Communications Flight, the only all-chopper unit in the RCAF at the time. Conditions were tough. Search and rescue was also put on a more organized footing. The country was divided up into five SAR regions, and 34 aircraft were earmarked for primary rescue. Norsemen, Dakotas, Kansos, Lancasters, and helicopters formed a network right across the country and up into the Arctic. The system also included rescue specialists trained in survival. Pararescue training was organized for RCAF medical personnel in 1951. It was the start of a system that would save tens of thousands of Canadians' lives. Enormous progress was made in the late 40s and 50s in polar navigation, another area where the RCAF gained worldwide recognition. Canadian navigators flew in United States Air Force B-29s from Edmonton and Alaskan bases, developing navigating procedures, testing radars, and completing invaluable mapping and charting projects over the high Arctic. But in the meantime, Canadian air and ground crews were again involved with the real thing in the Far East. In June 1950, the forces of communist North Korea attacked South Korea and Canada joined United Nations combined forces against this unprovoked aggression. Our main contribution was to the Korean airlift, which continued until the middle of 1954. RCAF North Stars flew between McCord Air Force Base near Tacoma, Washington, and Tokyo, using the northern route via Alaska and the Aleutians, or the southern way via Wake Island and Hawaii. 22 Canadian fighter pilots flew operationally in Korea on exchange with the USAF. Between them, they accounted for nine MiG-15s confirmed, two probables, and 10 damaged. Flying officer Ernie Glover was the RCAF's top gun. He was credited with three confirmed kills and received the first Distinguished Flying Cross awarded since the end of the Second World War. Squadron leader A.R. McKenzie was shot down and taken prisoner just before Christmas in 1952. 
He was set free by Chinese authorities in Hong Kong almost exactly two years later. In May 1951, the RCAF began recruiting women for the first time since the war. But this time, women could serve in the Air Force itself, not in a separate women's division. The RCAF Blue Devils aerobatic team was formed using vampires from 410 Squadron at Saint Hubert. They performed at many air shows in Canada and the US between 1949 and 1951. They were instant hits. At about this time, Air Force headquarters ordered the development of an all-Canadian, all-weather, long-range jet interceptor for the air defense role. This would eventually become the Avro Canada CF-100. After a difficult flight test program, the CF-100 entered service with number three operational training unit in North Bay in late 1952. In 1950, the government decided that Canada would provide an air division to our forces in Europe. Four wings of three squadrons each flying the latest fighter, the F-86 Sabre jet. The first Sabres went to 410 Squadron in May 1951. By early summer of the following year, three Canadian Sabre squadrons were in England flying as part of RAF Fighter Command. The first swept wing fighters to fly with the RAF. In the 50s, our Air Force had a very clear mission. We had a very high reputation for the competence of our air crew in Europe. We were a founding member of NATO, and the equipment we had was first rate. So it was a period in which the Air Force really felt that it was carrying out a really important national role. Certainly, the RCF was regarded very highly by its allied air forces in NATO in the 50s. Fighter group pulled off some impressive mass Atlantic crossings in this period. Whole wings of Sabres leapfrogged from Uplands and Saint Hubert through Goose Bay, Keflavik, and Prestwick, landing at temporary bases at Grotonken in France, or Zweibrücken and baden solingen in Germany. We were 63 Sabres in all, led by three DFCs, Edwards, McKay, Middlemans. On October the 1st, we took off from Goose in sections of four, with the sections five minutes apart. It was an exhilarating time. We were mostly just sprogs, and there we were, heading out over the ocean in single-engine fighters, heading for Greenland. Finally, late in 1954, the division came together at Marville in France and began receiving the new Orenda-powered Mark Vs in their warlike camouflage paint scheme. They were faster and could fly much higher than the Mark IIs, up to 50,000 feet. Not long afterwards, an important naval aviation milestone was reached. In October 1956, the first Canadian-built anti-submarine aircraft rolled out of de Havilland's in Toronto. This was the new tracker, CS-2F, built under license from Grumman. With the introduction of Banshee fighters for air defense and the Canadian-modified trackers, along with an experimental unit of six helicopters for ASW, the naval air branch seemed to be ready to take its place within one of the most capable small navies in the world. On the 17th of January, 1957, the powerful, renamed HMCS Bonaventure was commissioned in Belfast under the cranes of her builders, Harland and Wolf. By October, final modifications had been made and flying operations commenced. They would continue for 13 years. The Sabre jet seemed to symbolize the golden years of the RCAF through the 50s and into the 60s. Certainly, the Golden Hawks formation flying team displayed the necessary élan. Formed to commemorate the 50th anniversary of powered flight in Canada, they flew 65 shows through the summer of 1959. They were good. Newspapers called them the best in North America. Whenever our Sabres were in the air, incursion flights into NATO territory were recalled or postponed. The Soviets knew the MiG was inferior. 
And as for the cocky Canadians, they were sure they outmatched the Soviets in fighting spirit. It was not a universally joyful development when Ottawa decreed in 1956 that one squadron of each wing in Europe would have to give up their sabres and re-equip with CF-100s to give NATO a frontline all-weather interceptor. Maritime patrol and anti-submarine warfare flying was re-established at Greenwood in the early 50s. Avro and de Havilland modified scores of Lancasters for the task. The RCAF took delivery of 25 Lockheed Neptunes in 1955. This was a well-proven aircraft, bought as a stopgap between the Lancasters and the Argus, which was still on the drawing board. 405 Squadron re-equipped with the superb Argus in May 1958. This much-altered Bristol Britannia airframe was converted by Canadair into a preeminent ASW maritime patrol aircraft. It was refined further into the elegant and stately CC-106 Yukon long-range transport, which started to replace the aging North Star in 1959. NORAD, North American Air Defense Command, came into being in 1958. Data from the Defense Early Warning Line, the Mid-Canada Line, and the Pine Tree Line radar stations were fed into underground headquarters in Colorado Springs and regional stations such as North Bay. NORAD, the North American Air Defense Agreement, was designed to provide air defense against Soviet attack against North America over the pole. It meant very large American presence on Canadian soil and the presence of fighter aircraft capable of intercepting enemy aircraft working in very close association with the United States Air Force. But NORAD had a profound effect on the employment of the RCAF. It meant we were tied in absolutely like that with the United States Air Force. Our doctrine was the same, our attitudes were the same towards air fighting. And it meant that we developed a very competent, more than competent uh, ability to carry out air interceptions. This was what a fighter pilot dreams of. 